give us a hint and look. They've got to be around here somewhere. Don't you, Gareth? We haven't got any scissors. Hello, welcome to another Big Bang. In today's programme, we're going to be running the oldest race of all, the hare and the tortoise. We'll be discovering how ancient sailors found their way around at sea. And I finally discover what Violet keeps in her rucksack. I'm telling you, Gareth, scissors are old-fashioned. So what are we going to cut the string with? Our bare hands. Oh, be careful, Violet. You're more likely to cut your bare hands with string rather than the other way round. Aha, but the trick is to wind the string round your finger like that, then make a loop in it, bring it round the back of your hand. You see, string is really strong along its length. But if you make a kink in it and thread the end of the string through the kink... Are you ready? Be careful. One, two, three. Wow! And that didn't hurt? Well, actually, it did a bit. <laughs> but the thing is, to only use real string, the thinner the better, and never use that kind of plastic string. Ooh, that would hurt. Ooh. So if you don't mind, I'll continue using the scissors if I can find it somewhere. Wimp. Wimp? Right, I'm no wimp, and I'll prove it to you by the end of the programme with this banana. Paperwork getting you down? Blame the Chinese. They invented the stuff way back in 150 AD. Europe didn't take a leaf out of their book for another thousand years. A short while later, the printing press was invented and paper really took off. When the postal system was invented in the 1840s, it was possible to dump your paper on other people. Then, in the 1950s, the photocopier came along. At last, you could send people not one copy of your paper, but dozens. Finally, the personal computer was invented in the late 1970s. At a stroke, busy workers could do away with all their paper. Unfortunately, some bright spark invented the printer. So now there's more paper than ever before. Back to the drawing board. Gareth, I found the scissors. Oh, don't worry, Violet. I've managed quite well without. What are you making? Oh, this is Speedy, my tortoise. Look, you rev him up by pulling the string and... <laughs> you cannot call a tortoise Speedy, Violet. Well, I can. Me. This one, this one's highly trained. He'll take on all comers. A race? Right, then. You're on. The guts of my tortoise are a cardboard tube. You'll also need two circles of cardboard for the wheels and in each punch two holes and thread a rubber band through and tie it at the end. The wheels then get stuck to the axle. The next stage is to get a piece of string with sticky tape, tape one end to the axle and then tie the rest round. For the tortoise shell, you'll need a vegetable container that you get potatoes in at the supermarket. Cut slits in the side and one little hole at the end. The rubber band motor will go into this using matchsticks. Put the matchstick through the rubber band and then push it into the slot. And you'll have to secure that with sticky tape. The same the other side. Now, get the end of the string and push it through the hole at the end. And we can see the rubber band motor work. As you pull the string, the rubber band gets wound up, storing energy. So, when you let go of it... Ah! And to stop the string from going into the shell every time you do that, when you pass it through, make sure you tie a bead at the end. And that'll stop it from going through the hole. Finally, tip your tortoise the right way up. Make sure the string end is at the back. Add a tail and a head, like that, and some feet. I've made them all out of a brown paper bag. And your tortoise is ready to rock. Are you ready, Speedy? How are you getting on, Gareth? Yep. Meet Fleetfoot the hare. Prepare to lose by more than a hare's breath. Don't be ridiculous, Gareth. Everybody knows that tortoises always beat hares. The weight of history is against you. OK, we'll see, shall we? OK, Fleetfoot, prepare for a bad hair day. On your mark. Get set. And go! No. Go, Come Fleetfoot! On, Speedy. Go, on, Fleetfoot! Oh, no, he's run out of string! And it's the winner! I don't understand it. Tortoises always... 
always win. Ah, but Fleetfoot is no ordinary hare. If you look, he's got a narrower axle, which winds up more. He's got larger wheels, which makes it go faster. And he's got a longer string. There's one thing you didn't bank on, though. What? Meet Speedy's brother. Wow! Prepare for a rematch. Since time began, sailors have faced two huge problems. The first problem is knowing where they are. Oh! <laughs> oh, that's my best helmet. And that's the other problem. The sailor's best friend is the sun. Its height will tell you how far north or south you are. You can use it for east and west as well, for which you need one more thing, a clock. This is best explained using someone dressed in a stupid Earth costume. Assume that you're on a ship just off the coast of New Orleans, round about here. Now, you know when it's noon, because you look up and the sun is directly overhead. When it's noon here in New Orleans, it's way afternoon here in Britain. In fact, it would be 6pm, because Britain is a quarter of the way around the Earth. Now, suppose your ship sets out and it gets lost in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. They still know when it's noon, because they look up and the sun is directly overhead. And imagine that you had on board your ship a clock set to British time. You would know how far behind British time you were. If it's noon here in the Atlantic, the clock would tell you that it's 3pm here in Britain. Once you know the time, you can work out the distance. So all sailors had to do was to take a clock on their ship. Simple. Uh, no. Clocks in those days used pendulums, remember? Put a swaying pendulum on a swaying ship and it just won't work. What you need is a clock that's still accurate after several gruelling months at sea. Sadly, no one had such a clock until in 1760. May I introduce myself, madam? John Addison, a rologist. I'm a carpenter, I'm an engineer, and I am a designer of fantastic timepieces. But my clocks don't use swingy pendulum things. Oh, no, they use spinning springy things. After five months at sea, Harrison's clock was accurate to within a minute which was vastly better than anyone else's clocks in the 18th century, so at last sailors could work out where they were. And the navigation problem had been solved. Unfortunately, the other problem hadn't. Oh, dear. Oh. Gareth? I'm over here. What are you doing in the dark? I'm playing with light. In the dark? Yeah, look. Wow, it's a laser show without lasers. Yep, it's called a kaleidophone. Look, have a go, and I'll go and make another one. All you need is a plant pot and a piece of card about the same size as the base of the plant pot. You'll also need some coat hangers and some cork and these things, which are nice, brightly coloured beads. The shinier, the better. Or if you haven't got any of those, Try these shiny cake decorations. They work just as well, too. And you'll also need some plaster of Paris. Now, it starts off as a powder, you add some water, and before too long, it goes rock solid. Now, the first thing you need to do is to slice up your cork into little bits like this. Then, paint those bits nice and black, and then add your beads. Right, while they're drying, what you need to do is to get someone who's good with a pair of pliers to cut off the hooky bit of your coat hanger and straighten it out till it's perfectly straight, like this. Now, as soon as you've done that, this is very important, take one of your cork bits and glue it on the end because a bit of coat hanger sticking up like that is slightly dangerous. Now, do that with all four lengths of coat hanger, but do them different lengths because different lengths will vibrate at different speeds, giving you different patterns. Now, the next thing you need to do is a bit of clever bending. So get someone who's good with the pliers and do this. You do one twist at the bottom like that, then another twist going the other way like this. And what you've now done is created a nice stable base for your coat hanger. Now, tape all four coat hangers onto that bit of card, pop it inside your plant pot and pour in your plaster of Paris. Now, I'm sure I don't need to tell you to make sure that you've got paper underneath it. Then leave it to stand overnight to dry and you've made a collider phone. If you like, you can even decorate it with a bit of tape. You having fun, Violet? 
Yeah, it's great. Little <laughs> coloured dots move so quickly that your eyes can't keep up with them. So they kind of smear together to make these patterns. <laughs> Oh, I'm really looking forward to this walk. Onwards, 20 miles before tea. Oh! Be prepared, that's my motto. Oh! I'll tell you what, Violet. Yep. It's hardly a bridge, it's more like two posts. Yeah, well, take these. And you need to go over the other side so that down into the next field, turn left at the fence there, veer right past the oak tree, and uh, into the next valley. Yeah. Right, Violet. Out soon. Now it's ready for the rope. Yeah. OK, there's one loop, two loops over each other. Flip it on, and then you feed the rope through to get the right tension. Well done, Violet, or should I say Isambard Kingdom Berlin. That is a grand and fantastic bridge, but did you really have to build those towers quite that tall? Yeah, in fact, it was essential. If you'd be a bridge, I'll show you, that rope isn't as strong in this direction as it is, go down, pull down, in this direction. So, the taller the towers, the more vertical the rope. And so the stronger the bridge. Yeah. Well, let's see if your theory works then. I now declare this bridge officially open. Well done, hooray! After you. Oh, no, no. After you. OK. It's a bit wobbly. Be careful. But that doesn't mean it won't hold. And it looks like... Yay! It's going to work in practice. Well, it took my weight. <laughs> Gareth, why am I dressed like this? Because I will now prove to you my courage and strength through the art of banana jitsu. Ah, I get it. This is because I called you a wimp earlier on, isn't it? Hi, please hold up venerable fruit. OK. Hold very still indeed while I prepare. <laughs> and? Now peel, venerable fruit. Right. Oh, look, it's all gone into slices. Ah. <laughs> That's brilliant. How would you do that? Well, I did not use any ancient arts at all. In fact, I used... A needle and thread. Would you believe it? Let me show you. It's that old trick. Hold a banana for me. OK. What you do is take a needle and thread and go in through the ridges on the side of your banana, like that. In, and then in through that hole that you've just made, along to the next ridge. So you're going all the way round? That's it. You have to complete the uh, entire banana. And then, this is the best bit, you simply pull the thread and it pre-slices your banana, but you can't see. So, when you open it, dun, ta -da -ta 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 -ta, it looks like it's been banana jitsu. That's excellent, but does that mean you're not really an expert in banana jitsu? No, but I've got a GCSE in knitting, and uh, I did study in the Estevalon in North Wales, and I know how to do singing <laughs> and stuff. Come on, I'll take you on. Come on. <laughs> 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 